In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shine in our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge. And open the eyes of our minds, that we may comprehend the proclamations of your Gospels. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having trampled down all carnal desires, we may lead a spiritual life, while thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory, together with your Father, who is without beginning, and you are holy, good, and life-creating spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, very good. Yeah, with your kids, so you need to. No, I don't want to answer. Uh, maybe this Does anybody need a uh, copy of the Orthodox Study Bible? We have some extras here. Just if you would return them at the end, and uh, there may be some people coming in a little later, so uh, we'll just make room for them. We do have a couple of new people, I believe, for us here for the first time. If you're here for the first time, just you know, Matt, I know you are. So please introduce yourself. Give us a little background, if you would. I'm Matt. I'm uh, just visiting. Um, I'm a Catholic, so. Well, welcome. Welcome. Thanks, welcome. Good. Um, just quickly, first names go around so he knows. Uh, Miguel. Mary Lapps Catholic. Eastern Catholic Markham. All right, and per se. Hi. Hi. Is that it? Yep. Oh, okay. That's time. Okay. All right. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, excuse me, we were talking about 1 Timothy. Again, we have extra copies. If you need the question and answer, here they are. Please help yourself. And also, there are some pencils and pens right there. And Sandra's bringing cake around. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate that. Yeah, take one and or pass them on and take the last one. Yeah. Help yourself. There's enough pens and pencils, I think. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is turn to page 1634 in the Orthodox Study Bible. Uh, we were dealing with uh, chapter 2. Uh, the section here is called Faithfulness in Prayer that we started with. And um, last week we did most of uh, one to seven, but what we're going to do is repeat that section again so we can, it's been two weeks, and then we're going to start with the comments just on certain aspects of it. So uh, let's be, begin with that. Hernan, if you would read there two, one to seven, please. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peace, uh, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for hands and for all, who testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ. Not lying, teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Okay. Uh, one of the things, if you would, as we talk here, um, we want to uh, talk as loud as you can, uh, if you would, when you talk to, and speak up, because the people on Zoom sometimes have a difficult uh, time hearing if we're not uh, <clears throat> loud enough. Okay. So let's go to the question and answer there uh, for 2 1 to 7 on page 1. A. St. Paul uses four words that need to be offered. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks. By the way, did somebody take my uh, answer sheet? Let me check. 
because I made sure that I filled it out and uh, it would be bad if I didn't have uh, all the answers. I'm sorry? No, but not the answers that are there. All right, well, we're gonna learn. Ah, thank you, Kristen. There we go. All right. That's why you're seeing that. <laughs> okay, the first uh, word here that he uses is a supplication. Uh, in Greek, deesis. Deesis. Very good. Now, is simply what for something? Asking. It's simply asking for something, a request. All right, now he's going to talk about different ones here, so you'll see the difference as we go. This is an asking for something or a request. It can be used of a request made to a fellow person or to God. Prayer begins with a sense of need. Need. All prayer generally, if we're not glorifying and praising God, it's going to have to deal with need. It is the realization of our helplessness, very good, or inadequacy, very good, inadequacy, helplessness, or inadequacy. Now, should supplication be the first thing we address to God when we pray to him? No, why? Okay, so first of all, we need to either thank or praise him. Either one of those two comes first, and, and then obviously the other one second. We want to honor him. That's why when you look at everything that we start with in the Orthodox Church, blessed be the kingdom of the Father and of the Son. Blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, even when you say your own uh, prayers. Glory to God in the highest, etc. Josh. I was gonna say, like whenever you ask for something before you give glory, yeah, like, it's more like a transactional relationship. Very good. Be in what sense? What do you mean by that? Like you're you're coming to him and you're you know lowering yourself and you're like like a lot of times people will be like, if you do this for me, Lord, I'll change my ways. Yeah. And and usually when we get to that point. <laughs> yeah, transaction negotiation. Usually the need is so strong that we have nowhere else to turn. In other words, we're not coming to him out of praise and glorification and thanksgiving as much as supplication because I'm so low. Now, that's okay if you're in that situation. Don't get me wrong. But if you're in a normal situation, the first thing you want to do is glory, give him glory, honor, and praise and thanksgiving. Glory, honor, praise, and thanksgiving, then you can go from there, okay? Any other comments on that? All right, let's move on. Um, should we be bold in addressing our supplications to the Lord? Should we be bold? Should we be specific? Or what should we do? Okay, the first thing you want to do is approach him in humility. In humility. Can you still ask him specifically for something? Yes. 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 Why? Why would you do Why that? <laughs> okay, so you're expressing, does he know the need already? Yes. But you're letting him know. All right, so you're letting him know specifically. Now, after you make a bold statement and say, Lord, I really need your help in, let's say you're going to have an operation tomorrow or this or that. What is the phrase you probably always want to end with? Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Always end a prayer with thy will be done. Because we may be asking something that may not be for either our salvation or what's best for us. And only he would know that. And so we're going to talk a little about this later on. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to probably talk about it Sunday in the sermon where you talk about the cross. And there's a beautiful section there where you can tap, say that Sometimes we're going to learn more when we don't get our request answered and when we're humbled even more, when we may have to deal with sickness or deal with divorce or deal with this or whatever, if we learn from it, if we learn from it, if we are allow ourselves to be humble and move on, if we become angry and bitter, then we have another problem. All right. So, again, always end with thy will be done. Okay. Uh, going on to the next one. 
prayers in Greek? Prosechi. The basic difference between deusis and prosechi is that deusis may be directed to man or God, but this one is only used in approaching God. There are certain needs which only God can satisfy. There is a strength which only God can give, a forgiveness, forgiveness which he alone can grant, and a certainty. certainty which he alone can bestow. It is important to ask other people to pray for us. We want as many people praying for us as possible, but... In the end, only God can provide the strength, the forgiveness, and the certainty that can be ours. Okay, the next one, intercessions, entesis. Entesis. Our, like I said, <laughs> our request that we make on behalf of others. It is translated as petition. So, we again, start out with God. Praising him, honoring him, etc., then asking him supplications, prayers, and now intercessions for others. It is an interesting word. Originally, it meant simply to meet or to fall in with a person and to hold an intimate conversation with that person. It acquired a special meaning later when it meant to enter into a king's presence and to submit a petition to him. It acquired the technical meaning of a petition offered to a governor or a king. Thus, it tells us the way to God stands open, open to us. We're coming to the King of Kings. We're bringing our petition to the King of Intercession, to the King of Kings. And so we have that openness that he allows us to come to him. That there is given to us the gift of, gift of intimacy or intimate talk with God. Intimate talk. We can deal with him from our hearts. It's an intimate, open relationship that we have the right. right to bring our petitions to one who is king. The Christian is the person who has the right to take his needs into the royal presence of God. What does that actually mean to you? That you have the right to take your request to the royal presence of God. Yes. You're a son. You're a son, very or a daughter, which makes us children of him. And what does a father have toward his children? Love. And so what you see there is the love that a father should have for the children and that you can come into that right relationship and have an intimate relationship. Do people always feel that? Why not? Guilt. Guilt. So we may have sin that separates us from him. If we are guilty or feel we have a sense of sin, what does that do to how we see him? We're seeing him as like a judge. Okay, so we think we're going to get punished. He becomes the judge. Rather than we are coming to him with the love of a father should have for the children, to restore the relationship. If we come to him in with guilt and sin, what is the first thing we need to do? Yeah. Confess and repent. In other words, and we're going to hear that time and again in scripture, before you come and offer your gift to the altar, go and make peace with your brother or sister, then come back and offer it. All right? And we're going to talk about who's leading the public worship and what they must have in, in a few minutes coming up. But we have to watch not only what we ask from God, but how we approach it. And so, which do you think has more importance? Oh. How? Why? He knows what we're going to say anyway, so it's our, our spirit that's important. What we're... So he's going to maybe grant us whatever we want based on how we approach it, what's in our heart. Kristen? I was also going to say, yes, it's love or it's guilt, but it could also be um, some anger as well. Oh yeah, could be any yeah. any sin, I any a, sin. I have a friend that um has told me when we have when we talk that he doesn't want me to mention any type of like he respects my decision of being a believer. Yes, so he doesn't want to hear anything about it. When I asked him why, he said because I prayed and prayed and prayed for him to save my grandma and he didn't. 
and she fell back. So he sends he harbors anger toward God because of. And it's interesting because that goes back to, uh, goes back to exactly what uh, Josh mentioned. It becomes a transaction. Mm -hmm. I'll do this for you, God, if you save my grandmother. You know, and you, that's not how we approach God. It's like entitlement. It's an entitlement. Yeah, that's okay. It's an entitlement. And what happens with that is, let's ask the question. Do we need him or does he need us? <laughs> in a sense, he needs us if, if you look at a father and children. But we need him. We need him is the point about it. And so I think that you always want to be careful, going back to what we just talked about, how we approach him. What is the motive that we're coming to him with? What's in our heart? How do we, is there humility there? Is there patience, et cetera? Um, you know, when you think about it, let, let's use that as an example, because we were just talking about this uh, Sunday I talked about, but also in the, our class uh, at five o'clock. When you look at three couples, Abraham and Sarah, Look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, and look at Joachim and Anna. They were all up in age, and the three women were barren. In those days, if you were barren, what was it the people thought of you? Cursed. You were cursed because you committed some yeah. sin. They always uh, related sickness, especially, and not being able to bear children with sin before Christ came. And yet, you look at all three, and they were blessed. But what did they do? They remained patient. They were humble. And they always, in fact, with Joachim and Anna, they didn't even allow him to come and offer. He was a priest to give the gift at the altar. They rejected his gift in the Jewish temple. So he went off, and what did he do? He prayed. He prayed so many times, you know, that probably would be the best thing for your friend mm -hmm. is, God, I don't understand it, but I know you allowed it. There must be a reason. Help me to move on with my life and understand. It. And, and it's so difficult, though. Let's be honest. When you're going through something mm -hmm. and you lose somebody or you lose something or whatever, you don't see the positiveness in anything. It takes sometimes months, weeks, months years later that maybe you can understand it and maybe you'll never understand it. Then he, I think sometimes too we tend to compare ourselves to people that we see as doing what we would consider better than us. We when we're in a bad place, we say, oh look at them. They're the, we don't look at the person that's worse off mm -hmm. than us. We're or the other thing that happens is we see somebody who prayed and grandmother did get healed. <laughs> yeah. And that is the then and they say, well why did it happen there and not here? And anytime you ask the question why, you probably were going to drive yourself crazy. It's, yes, Sandra. I think it's, we, all, we just expect too much sometimes, you know, that Good. there's the reality of life. That, Good. You know, you can say, why me? Why am I? Why do I have cancer? Why Why this? And, you know, it's always, well, why not? Right. Or why Why not you or someone else? You yeah. Know, someone's, there's always going to be, you know, what we call bad things happening to good people. But, right. You know, you still have to believe. Have we live in what kind of world? Fallen. Fallen. Fallen world. And what, what, once you can accept the fact that life is not fair, you live a better life. Mm -hmm. If you expect it to be fair, you'll have to wait till the second coming of Christ to get that. And that Kevin. Was, that was my experience because I had cancer. You know, okay. You speak from you know, uh, experience yeah, yourself. I, I could have had a choice to either curse God or, you know, come to God and really my experience of coming to God was through my experience of cancer. So that's it. And I appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, and we'll keep you in our prayers that it stays that way uh, too, because uh, it's so easy to go the other way. It's so easy. It is difficult to take the hard road and try to accept it. Yeah. Hernan. I think also um, just thinking about this, like, with the last line it says uh, going into the royal presence of god right yes um if, if you study the the history of like i studied the torah and everything they didn't have they weren't able to get into the presence of god it was only through a select a few people um they weren't able to pray with the holy spirit like we are able to pray all of that is done only because of jesus christ that's only why, because that's of why christ. the one mediator the one the one man that mediated yeah. between us and god 
the fact that we have this um, privilege to be able to do it, yeah, right, should at least give us like a perspective of like, you know, I I shouldn't feel so entitled, you know, yeah, because there was not it wasn't always like this. You know, the veil was broken when Jesus started. You know, it's like a lot of things we don't appreciate what we have until you don't have it. Mm-hmm. And I think that when you look at these people, you know, in the past and what we have today, ever since Christ came, and we are blessed to be able to go and have an intimate relationship with the Lord. And and that's why, uh, you know, sometimes like um, recently I blessed the home and uh, this person who is a recent convert to the Orthodox Church with his family, he showed me his prayer closet. And for him, it was a closet. And he puts icons in there, candles and the Bible, etc. And for him, that made that presence really known. And I looked at that and talk about, you know, now it, it also talks about going into your heart, you know, in terms of going into your closet, going in deep into your heart to have that relationship with the Lord too. But again, how we set that up for ourselves has a lot to do in how we approach him sometimes too. So, it, again, you're right about that. We have the opportunity to be in his presence at any time, anywhere. That's the other thing. You don't have to come into the church building to do that. It could be any time, anywhere. Okay, uh, let's go on. The next one um, is Thanksgiving. If uh, One for four. <laughs> We are to thank God for his mercy and favor shown to us, which is basically grace. It is notable that one of the chief traits of the unregenerate people is the absence of gratitude to God. Why do you think that's the case? So I think that I'm sorry? Not a believer. Not a believer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. The question was what's unregenerate would be a non believer. A non believer. Okay. Why do people have trouble being grateful to God? What happens, first of all, to a lot of people after they get what they won't ask for? They think they did. <laughs> <laughs> they forget it quickly. They don't thank God for it. It's like, okay, well, I expect that. Martina, how are you? They expected that, and uh, it, it, life goes on. You know, I think what happens if if we start coming to Him only when we need something, what do you eventually think could happen? We forget Him. We forget Him. Or he'll forget us. No. no, okay. What else could happen? We don't need him until the time that there's another occasion. Right. And what what is the result of that then? What happens to us? Well, I'd say like then you become like one of the foolish virgins. Yeah, you become foolish in a sense. He almost going to him like a I hate to say this, a gumball dispenser. An ATM. Yeah, an ATM. Put your card in and you get something out. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't like work that way. Reason, which means like yeah. Going to God for Only for your own that's, needs. That's you're not going for a relationship. You're not going to praise him. You're not going to thank him. Sure. I think one of the most difficult things is <clears throat> to be ungrateful. Because somebody who can be ungrateful, are they ever satisfied? Usually not. Usually not. If you start to become more and more ungrateful, then you don't see the positives in anything. You start to see only what you don't have, what you lack, what's missing, etc. And so we want to be very careful because it can spiral down very easily. Okay, you may have heard of this one illustration before, uh, especially if you come from a Protestant point of view. It said, uh, when you fold your hands, and fold your hands, you can do this if you want. The what is the nearest finger to you? The thumb. All right. So begin by praying for those who are closest to you, your loved ones. That's in Philippians 1, 3 to 5. The next finger is the index finger. It's called the pointer. Pray for those who teach, Bible teachers, uh, preachers, those who teach children, 
any anybody there. The next finger is the tallest. Reminds you to pray for those in authority over you, national, local leaders, your supervisor at work. The fourth finger is usually the weakest. Pray for those who are in trouble or who are suffering, James 5. Then comes your little finger. Reminds you of the smallness of relationship to God's greatness. Ask him to supply your needs, Philippians 4, 6 to 19. When you think about it, why is the last one last? It's focused on you. It's focused on us. We should put ourselves last. And when we think of it, true, truly, he is the great God. We, He's the cr creator. We're the creatures. So we are in need of him. We should come to him uh, very humbly. But this is good for kids. So <laughs> when they pray, uh, it's easier for them to remember things like that if you want to uh, help them teach that. Okay, see, in verse 4, whom does our Savior desire to save? All, All men. He wants them to come to a knowledge, knowledge of the yeah. what? What do you get by that? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. The Reconciliation. The osis. You start to grow closer and closer in uh, to God and in God. <clears throat> what else? Peace. It helps you see through the turmoil in the world. That's a good point. Uh, talk a little more about that. It helps you to see see through the turmoil or the chaos in the world. Well, if you know something's true and something tries to, in the world tries to pull you away, it's easy to see that. It's like, no, this is a truth. I mean, I have, I'm very clear with my kids. You don't use the Lord's name in vain. You can say any other cuss word to me. But you cannot say that. And even the worst kid, he'll do it once. And I say, you're going to get in big trouble. You can't do that. That's, you know, you so you have drawn the line. Yeah. And that he respects that. Yeah. He respects it. If you did not draw the line, I have a feeling that you would still be okay. hearing a lot. Still be saying it. Yeah. they don't even think. Yeah. So it brings it to their awareness that, you know, and it makes me realize we have a relationship. They honor me enough. Now, I don't care what else they call me or whatever, but just don't do that. Yeah. Because it's hurting you and it hurts me. And it hurts me. Yeah. Like Miguel. To what Mary said regarding. Speak up. Uh, to that, that knowledge of the truth. Yes. Helps you deal with the confusion in the world. And, and if you don't have, if you don't know what you believe and why you believe it, you, it's also very difficult to muster courage and to stay firm in whatever it is. You know, it, it reminds me of, it's a good point, Miguel. <clears throat> when you don't have, what, what does it say in Hebrews? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, yesterday today, today, and forever. And so you don't have to guess who he is or where he is. All right? What we need to find out is where are we in relationship to him? But what happens is when you have the knowledge of the truth, you're not thrown to and fro. That you have what I would call like you're on a compass. You have a due north, and that's Christ. And so then, yeah, you may get right or left but to think about things. But what is the one thing that we want to have as a gift to be able to use in our minds to be able to, I don't want to give the word away. Um, yes, we, we need to have discernment discernment so that we can separate the chaff from the good and so you uh, in in today's world that's becoming more and more challenging mm -hmm. and i i would venture to say there are more more and more people including so-called christians who are bending to go to society's ways but it says you know in scripture you're either going to um worship god or mammon we have a choice but I think we have to be very careful as we start going the other way. And unless you have a knowledge of the truth, you know, I think it's going to be difficult. And that's going to come even more uh, apparent as we get closer to the second coming. Mary. Can I share what I talked to you about? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, with the shooting that happened uh, in Georgia, and we've had kids, you know, that are quite capable of doing that in our school. And on Tuesday and Wednesday, it was a chaotic day. You know what I mean? A lot, a lot of bad stuff going on at school. No one got hurt, per se, but 
And so the next day, and this is the day after the shooting, uh -huh. they're talking to staff, just saying, oh, this kid did this and this kid did that, and da 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 da. And I'm just going, wait a minute. Yeah, we've got some behavior problems. But let's remember what happened in Georgia. You know, and I said, we need to pray for those kids, for those families, for that school. I said, we're fortunate to have a real good security system at our school. You know, let's accept our blessings. And they said, you know, I know we had a rough day, but not like George is having right now. We need to focus on them. Yeah. And then the next thing my assistant principal said, this is not public school. I am shocked. Mary, we offer prayer. Wow. wow. I get goosebumps. Well, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> praying out loud, but it was like I really, really felt because I, I knew we have Jewish people there, we have atheists, we have, and I'm going, all right, well, and I kept it pretty Christian up in, you know, I couldn't go into Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right. But you know, Lord God, you know, yeah. I'm heavily I try to say Father, you know, and uh, but then at the end the Virgin Mary came in. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 <laughs> but I, I did get a couple of staff come up and they said, and that's the first time ever my 20 years at this school that has ever anyone has said a prayer out loud. We'll have moments of silence. And of course, the kids weren't there, but it's like I just wrote it all day. That's great. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah. Uh, two things that I may comment on that, Mary. Number one, they knew you. And that is very important. They saw you as having a knowledge of the truth. Yeah. And they respected that. Right. And the fact that you spoke up and said, let's put this in perspective, in right. sense, what you did, what we were just talking right. about, using right. discernment to say, yeah, we may have had a bad day here today, but look at what could be, the and let's thank God yeah. for what we have. Right. So I, I felt you put that in perspective very well, and then to ask you to pray, that had to be the Holy Spirit. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I really believe yeah. that. So, uh, thank you for standing up. Yeah. And I think that good example. that's an example to stand up for what you believe in a way that you didn't shove it down anybody's throat. Right. But, right. Mary, you would not have been wrong to say anything that you said that you didn't say. <laughs> I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, um, that's right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, C, first bullet. The mediator. Mesitis. Mesitis. Between God and man is the man, Christ Jesus. One who reconciles the previously estranged. Christ cares for all people, even the pagans, striving to draw them to repentance and salvation. There's always hope. The statement of Paul simply echoes what Jesus said in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What does that say about non-Christians? They can't come to the Father. <laughs> very good there uh they can't come to the father are they going to be saved or could they be saved yes why would you say yes kevin uh because they uh, they always have a chance to repent until their last breath okay they have a chance to repent okay and who is the only person who knows the heart christ so we have to always be very careful. If you read the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, for whom are you going to be responsible? Yourself. Yourself. You have to make a decision there, and as does each and every other person, all right? But Christ will be the judge and not us. So usually I say be very careful. Now, you may hear some people say, as Orthodox Christians, there will only be Orthodox in heaven. 
Went back to my Protestant friend and I said, you got to be Catholic. You got to be Catholic. You're not going to go to heaven if you're not. If you're not Roman Catholic, Catholic. yeah. Yeah. Nick? I, I've also heard other um, clergy members, like on YouTube, for example, say things like. Talk up to me. Okay. Um, I've also heard other priests and clergy members say things like, you know, while that might be an Orthodox um, uh, view, uh, it's. Also possible, obviously, that God works, you know, however he feels fit outside of the church. Out, yeah. 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 Here's an interesting, and one of the theologians, an Orthodox theologian, put it this way. There is no salvation outside the church. No salvation outside the church. How many, raise your hand if you believe that that's a true statement. No salvation Okay, now. How many would disagree with that? Okay. Why would you disagree? Me? Yes. Well, my knowledge is limited, but it just doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're not moved by the spirit. Oh, don't take my don't <laughs> take my <laughs> 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 I want to hear some other answers first. <laughs> no, Miguel and Mary, go ahead. Uh, no, my, my, my only reason is because of the thief. I mean, yeah, he, he, he repented at the last minute. But I don't want to call him. He, we we would say he's in the church. Yeah. Oh, that's then, right. then I changed my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel changes his vote. Yeah, you know, Marco said it right on the head. It depends on how you define the church. Usually when think, we think of the church, we think of the building right off the bat. You know, we think of our own local congregation or the Orthodox Church in general. The church, only Christ knows who's in the church. When you think about it, they're going to be Roman Catholics and Protestants, and you know them. You work with them who are good Christian people, all right? And so, therefore, he wants all people to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. Miguel. The, the book that I read is an introduction to orthodoxy. It began in the first pages with the definition of the church as the body of Christ in right. the world. And so is that what we're that's what we're talking about. Right. It's yeah. the body of believers. And we let's be honest. When we go to church on Sunday, we gather as a community of believers. All right. Now, uh, compared to once saved, all always saved, we're saying that we are fallen sinners. Christ died for us, we put our faith in him, but it's a daily falling down and getting up again, falling down, getting up again. It's a daily taking up our cross and following him. So we're going to sin, but we have to confess and repent of that and move on. And we're going to talk about that later on. He speaks about it very clearly, Paul does, I think, with the leaders in the congregation. But what happens here, it is, becomes very important then to realize that only Christ knows who's in the church. And, I, you know, there's always that, I don't know if you've heard that statement, basically, there are going to be some surprises. Some people we thought would be there and are not. And some people we thought would not be there are probably going to be there. Yeah. You know, uh, there is a joke about that, but I'm not going to tell it because I'll, I'll mess it up. So uh, I'll, I'll save that for the future. I used to once in a sermon about, and what about me? <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, Christian. Yeah, so could it be said then that where we are now, this is the church, and that would per se just be a building system? Because that would be what? the body of Christ. Uh, yeah. We here, we yeah. here, the body of Christ is here. So yeah, in essence, this is we're the, we're the church here. Yeah, the church is everywhere and wherever people of believers are. So whether you're out there in a monastery, whether you're in the church building, whether you're out in uh, the mountaintop, or you're at home or whatever, it's the body of believers. And we talk about two different churches. We talk about the militant church, those of us here fighting the good fight here on earth, and then the uh, triumphant church, those believers who have gone before us, who have died and had their faith in Christ. So they were all joined together. And that's the beauty about when the priest does the proscomedia, he includes both the living and the dead. And so we're all part of the body of Christ. That's why we pray for others. We ask them to pray for us, etc. So it's, uh, you always think of it in terms of, you know, you hear the three B's. You think of the uh, church being the building. That's what most people think of. The body, like we're talking about, which is the 
correct answer totally. And then the other one uh, you think of it is the bridegroom. We are uh, the bride, excuse me. Jesus is the bridegroom and we are his bride. And so it's a beautiful analogy. So the last two are the more important ones, not the building as much, but the bride and the bridegroom, the relationship there, and then also the body of believers. But I don't think we want to diminish the significance of the building no. either. That's why we don't do weddings on the beach in Honolulu or somewhere. We, mm -hmm. all, we do them in the church. <laughs> we do that, you know, that is the purpose of it. That's, you know, it's... Yeah, so it, it's, that's a it's good not point. Just the body. It's not just a bunch of us get together down on Howard. We what? can do whatever we want. I mean, it's... That's a good point. Now, in other words, there's always a question. Um, and let me make two points here. It reminds me of the woman who came and wiped Jesus's feet with her tears and her hair and so forth in the ointment. What was she accused of? Wasting, wasting, wasting money. money. So when you build, construct a building for the glorification of God, and somebody will come up and say, well, this is too over the top. We should have used it to help the poor, the needy, those, you know, we can go on and on and on. So many people want to make it either or. And I always say, try to make it both and. Now, there is, I think, a point where you can go over the top. But normally, what I would say is this. Everything should be driven by need. If you have people coming and you need to have a, a bigger church or something, then there's a need. What you want to be careful of, which happens sometimes, is some people, because they can't afford it, will build a huge church and then have a half of it empty. And to me, I think that's not right. If you have a need and you see a future and you are working toward it, then you should do what you need to do. But if you're doing this to show that we can do it, it reminds me of the Tower of Babel. You have to be very careful why you're doing what you're doing. And so I would rather take a small wooden church that is humble than something elaborate. The other thing you have to remember is what happened to the temple? It got destroyed. Go to Agia Sophia today in Constantinople. It's a mosque for all intents and purposes. If you start to have your heart attached to a building, you're going to be very disappointed. Now, do we want to see that? No. Would it be nice to have Augie Sophia restored? Of course. You know, but don't, it's the body of believers. It's where, that's where the church is. So, you, you know, you can have, what does he say when, how many are gathered? Two or more, two or three are gathered. I am in the midst. I am in the midst. Okay. And yes, Mary. Question about the church, militant and triumphant. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it possible and you mentioned it on the patent, they're both combined in the chalice. But um, I think in our in our life, is the saints inner inner fear, inner jets, intercede. our lives intercede. And so it's like it comes, the two merge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what happens is that if, uh, prayers to the saint. And yeah, what happens is a beautiful, if, and Father Starburst will probably do this for you when you, those of you going through the Orthodoxy 101 class. You'll do a Prosco Media, I think. I'm not sure. But yeah. I showed it to the kids in Sarasota recently that I took a, a, a Prosphora. And you can see it's beautifully uh, uh, divided up. There's the, the middle one called the Lamb is for Christ and has the letters I C X C in English, uh, N I K A. So it'll be. The first and last letters of Jesus and the first and last letters for Christ. And N-I-K-A stands for conquerors. So you divide that up when the priest divides. He says, divide and distribute as the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. I-C is put in the chalice for Christ. Mm -hmm. The X-C is used for the communion of the clergy. And the N-I-K-A, two pieces, are used for the communion of the faithful. But on the right-hand side of the Lamb is uh, a triangle for the Virgin Mary. Right. And on the other side are th the three small, uh, the nine small uh, triangles for the nine ranks of angels, archangels, prophets, etc. So all the Old Testament and, and New Testament. And then on the top is the living and the dead. So you have the entire church represented. 
And it's beautiful with uh, so that people have this concept of seeing the church. So you can offer, by the way, name, uh, names of the living and departed to give to the priest to commemorate, and he'll take a particle out for them, uh, especially during Lent that we have Memorial Saturdays off. But any Sunday, I get regularly people will either who have made the cross for or who want to re be remembered on that day because it's an anniversary of a, uh, a death or or else they're in need for a specific request. So yeah, it's it's beautiful the way the whole church is, is uh, put together. Yeah. Any other co comments or questions on that? Uh, Martina. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I um, can show you. Can I show you? Yes. Yeah, I just visited um, three weeks ago. Okay. So uh, Martina is from originally Sofia, Bulgaria. She just went back uh, to Bulgaria to visit her family. And you went to Constantinople. I did. Yeah. Wow. Tell us yeah. about it. So, um, and I don't know if all of you know about Saint Sophia. It was a big scandal a couple of years ago, I think in 2021 or something like that, when they turned it to a mosque. Mosque. Yeah. So my mom and I went to visit it, and um, it's very sad because it's a huge, and the first floor only Muslims are allowed, um, and the second floor tourists and everybody else. But the problem is it's all open, so you can see what's happening down. So the second floor where where we were allowed. There were all these icons, and mm -hmm. my mom and I were doing metania, so prostrations. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we were going around, and then at one point, when I was doing my last prostration or my second, she cries, I was on the floor, and then I hear someone like hitting me and saying something. So I get up, and it's this woman that works here, and she starts yelling at me, forbidden, forbidden. And I'm like, I don't, like, I don't understand what you're saying, but I'm like, and like, there's Christ, I'm here, there's this woman, she's like yelling at me, and I'm like crossing myself, I don't know why I crossed myself, this one girl, Good. doing this, and she like started yelling even more, she said, forbid on, like you can't even cross yourself there. Oh and uh, then my mom started freaking out because it's a Muslim country, and it's, they can do whatever they want. Right? Yes. And my mom was like, please stop, please stop, let's go, let's go, and in Bulgaria, and then this woman is calling someone, then I get upset, because I'm like, oh, I'm like betraying Christ, like, I'm not, I'm not going to, like, wow. stop, like, doing what I'm doing, and it's like, I'm in this middle thing where I'm like, do I do my last Netanya, do I, <laughs> 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 my mom is like, do I do it on the run? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm like right there, and like she's about to start crying, and this woman is like, then police is coming. It was oh, that could be an international incident. So this Turkey, they can do literally. They can do whatever. Right. Yeah, they can, yeah. You know, thank God that God knows I won't survive jail, so that <laughs> scared me. But um, but I'm like sitting there, and like she's in front of me. This woman, she gets very close, and she's just waiting for me to do one more thing. Yeah. And my mom's like saying, "Oh, they're priests, priests, like that's what they're waiting. They're yeah. waiting for you. They warned you, and now they're just waiting, and they will arrest you." So, and I'm thinking, like, my mom will have a heart attack. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Your heart attack. I can't. Yeah. Yes. 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 So uh, we leave, and they're all following us the whole time. And I'm like, "No, I'm gonna stop at this side." And my mom's like, "Please." <laughs> 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 yeah. Um. But it was so sad because uh, imagine you're in church with all the icons in front of you. Yeah, and you cannot, and you cannot venerate them. No, you cannot wow. cross yourself. No. Like, you cannot do any Christian sign there. No. Wow. And wow. meanwhile, because it's all open, and you see downstairs, you yeah. see the Muslim constantly like, you know, praying. Praying. Yeah. 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 Hear the chants. Yeah. The chants. Mm -hmm. And it was such a sad moment. Like we came out and we started crying. And yes. I was thinking like, this is preparation for our future. Yes. It's like we have to get used to things like that because they're going to happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um and it's when you're in the moment you really don't know what to do. Because even after that I confessed it to my spiritual friend, I was like, Did I betray Christ? Right. 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 But it's like such a tricky situation that I'm thinking how we are living in today in today's society and where yeah. we take it in the near future. But and it's wow. Like, just like, yeah, 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 thanks for sharing that. Did everybody on Zoom hear her speak? Yes. Okay, some of you did not. Okay, uh, Martina just came back from Constantinople, and she said that basically in Hagia Sophia, the Muslims now are, are allowed on the bottom floor and Christians only on the second floor where there's icons. And she was venerating uh, the icon of Christ, and the woman there, uh, the uh, Turkish woman, said, for forbidden you can't do that and so she made the sign of the cross and she got even angrier and basically what happened is the police came and so they had to make a decision on what to do so uh you know she would have kept on doing this they probably could have arrested her very easily 
especially with Edrigan in charge now. He has gone to the far right. When I was there in about 2003, that was not the case. We were down on the bottom floor. We were on the second floor. You had the icons that were, they actually were uh, taking the whitewash off of them because most of the tourists want to go to Agia Sophia, not to the Blue Mosque. Mm -hmm. But there was a couple recently in Sarasota who told me they just came back from there and they are now charging you to go into Agia Sophia, mm -hmm. but they won't charge you to go into the Blue Mosque. And so he's really taking it to the extreme now. And it is a definitely, uh, he's making it more and more Muslim uh, country in, in terms of being very strict. Yeah, and even the way a lot of the icons were partially covered with white cloth, yeah. but not really because you can still see them. It's almost like they've done everything on purpose to like aggravate. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like yeah. some of the angels, they had like a gold plate, the cherubim and the seraphim, yeah. the ones with the six wings. They yeah. had like a gold plate mm -hmm. on their face, yeah. but some of them didn't. Yeah. It was like almost that's what we can do here. One, it, it was like on both corners. One was like not covered, and the other one had a gold plate yeah. on its face. Mm -hmm. The, um, the Theotokos was on one corner and there was this white veil, but you can still see her. Like, because yes. she's like on top and, she, and mm -hmm. she's watching the Muslims. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was a defilement of the, if you pray there, as like, a Christian, we're defiling them. So it's, yeah, but they left everything for us to do it. They're just not, it, it was this tricky, weird wow. thing that they were doing, like, it, it's much. almost like luring your win yeah, sure. to make to fall yeah. so that they yeah. can arrest you then and make it yeah, real bad. Yes, Marco. Wow. All right, to say this while you were there and going through that, you were sending us the video. You remember? Yes. <laughs> and we were praying for you, honey. Oh, thank that's you. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And you weren't arrested. No, no. it's not. It's it not, it's could have been crazy. easily it's done. Crazy. Yeah. Easily done. Because I. But my mom's friend who's Turkish, she said, you and even not one Italian you cannot do. And I did so many, so and there was cameras all over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll see you on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Azalea. Uh, so yesterday in the Orthodoxy 101 class, Father Chavo said like the altar has to like always be there. And like if the community were to like dissipate or something, like the altar is just moved to like a different side of the church. So in the case of like Agia Sophia, like where would what would happen to the altar? I don't even know. That's a good question. I to be honest with you, I don't know what has happened. If, I don't if it's even still there, given the circumstance today. I, I don't know the answer to that. It's not theirs. No, it's not. No, but I again nothing would surprise me. I think what um Martina said. <clears throat> You look, <clears throat> what does the devil do? He tries to separate, divide, and he uses different people to do that for him. But he's also smart. And so I think he knows how to get people to take action up to a certain point and then back off. So you have enough, if I could use the term, rope to hang yourself. You know, it's like, let me lure you in, and then you take the bait, and then I'll do something to you down the road. But uh, I really think that this is just a sign of the times for the for the future, you know. And uh, I think it's twofold. I think what you see in the United States sometimes is we're going to disintegrate from within because of our unbelief and uh, non repentance and and uh, unre unreliance on the Lord. And then you're going to have the others just be able to come in and overcome us who are already infidels, you know, and so forth. So it's going to be a combination of rottenness from within so that the outside could come in but you know again only time will tell josh oh i was just gonna say um because you were talking about dividing yes and uh we were talking about the body and like who's in the body and stuff. right and i wanted to get um because this is a verse that i always think about whenever i think about like who's in the body and who's yeah. not uh-huh so it's mark 9 38 i'll be 38 and 39 mm -hmm. uh so it's now john answered him saying teacher we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name yes and we forbade him because he does not follow us but jesus said do not forbid him for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me for he who is not against us is on our side yes i want to get you know kind of yeah i think this is know. very important because let me ask you this can the devil have people uh, and his minions perform miracles? Yes. 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 So what you have to be very careful of is discernment. 
Now, what he says is, read that section that says, in my name. Uh, wait a second. Um, do not forgive, do not forbid him for no one who speaks works a miracle in my name. In my name. You see, I think that some of these others were not doing in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very careful. And that's why we keep going back to that one word, discernment. You know, is this from the Lord or is from the devil? Because he can be very deceiving. He is a deceiver. And I think that's why it's even more important not to judge somebody about who's in the church and who's not, but to also discern between, let's say, what Martina went through and somebody else. I don't know. You have to look at it and say, you know, am I taking, is this what the Lord would want me to say or do, etc. But when it comes down to others, you know, and how, let me ask you this. How eventually can you decide whether it's from the Lord or from the devil? The fruits. The fruits. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You will see it in the end. You will see the fruits in the end. It may take a while, but this happens with a lot of people. There could be a lot of people. For example, I see a lot of self-proclaimed preachers, let's say. And they'll go out and do a lot of things, etc., and be very good in preaching and teaching and all that until something you see that says this doesn't add up. They're seeking a lot of attention for themselves. It's pride for themselves, drawing attention to themselves rather than to the Lord. So that's why Paul later says to a lot of people, you know, don't go after Apollos, don't go after Peter, don't go after me. You're after Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. You know, but you could even be a good evangelist. And people will follow you, and you have to always point them to Christ. That's why the beauty, beauty about the icon of the Virgin Mary and the entire life, as well as John the Baptist, always pointed to whom? Jesus. Christ. Even when she's holding the child, you can see it, and she's, you know, here it's he, he, he here he is. And, and what does the Baptist say? He says, "I must decrease so he can increase." increase. Yes. Oh, so say, 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 like, we're for all of us. Yes. Say we're in Martina's situation. Yes. Are we to seek persecution and even martyrdom? Or, like, what's good question? What do you think? And, and it's interesting the way you put that, that you phrase that. Should we seek it? Yeah. No, why not? What's the difference between what he said, should we seek it, or should we take a stand for it? Exactly. Seeking is, look at me. I'm gonna make, in other words, most people did not want to be beheaded. All right? And so what you realize is that they're not going out there and say, here I am, I'm a follower of Christ, come and get me. You know? <laughs> so, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that uh, and, and this is why I always talk about the same way in the military. You train and train and train for war or anything else, and they always call it the fog of war. She made a very good point there. She said, I didn't know what to do. She said, I was in this. In fact, later, Martina said, I went to my spiritual father. Did I deny Christ? She had a dilemma. And most things in life are going to be dilemmas. And you have to deal with the uncertain, the unknown. And all I would say to you is, you don't know. It, you, you train to prepare, and you do the best you can, not knowing what you would do in that situation. So, God forbid if she were arrested, <coughs> it would. I think she would have dealt with it. But I think she was smart. She could have provoked them. And that she did not do. That would have been seeking martyrdom, in my estimation. So, in a sense, I think her mother had a very good point. You know, we could either take a stand on this. The only way that it probably would have been good to take a stand is if you had the media there. You still going to arrest her, though. But then it would have been bad on them. Right. Yeah. I so, I think that's where you have to look at is what does it come down to? The intent. So, would you say, like, if you come to that point where, like, you see that's going to happen, you just accept it? I'm not saying you accept it. I'm saying you do what you have to do given the circumstance, and each circumstance is different. God knows your heart, too. And he knows your heart. And that's what it will come down to, is what's in your heart and what you believe. 
And and so and it's not as though she turned around and said, "Oh, yeah, I don't believe in any of this. I'm just no, pulling around yeah. or something." Yeah, right. She, she, didn't deny it. It. she didn't yeah. deny it. Yeah, yeah. And that's what my spiritual father said. He said, "You proclaim your faith." Yes, yeah. But because I felt very activated when she was in my face, like right. it was my pride wanting to go. Oh, you want right. to? Yeah. Want to take some lunch on it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But she knew. I'm like, yeah. But that would have been like, I wanted to be like, you're not going to tell me what to do in my church. Yeah. That's right. And then, you know, but also Christ works in mysterious ways. My mom was there. If my mom was not there, I'm very like stubborn. I probably would have done it on. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And then I would have been in trouble. But maybe I cannot survive jail. Maybe they they can do things where they can make me say, I don't believe in Christ. Yes. But then I'll be like, denying Christ. Yes. So only that means how much we can. Yes. Yeah. I do not think it yes. was right in your case because I was we were listening to you. We were watching your live video. I think it was righteousness. Mm-hmm. I yeah. do, and I believe that that only God knows what impact you're witnessing for Christ had on that woman. Yes, and mm-hmm. others, yeah. and the police that were called. They were probably thinking, oh no, another Christian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You showing so You're right. No, you're right. I think you make a good point. Yeah. And and Martina is right too. I think with her mother being there, you took that into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that may have been your angel there to That's protect right. you. Yeah. Right. And also something about how things were because we left and I was in my head, oh look at me, I made all these frustrations, then I post myself and blah blah in my head. Yeah, I know. Because the pride comes right away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we get to the hotel and then I have to fight with my mom because my mom is crying. She's like she's like, How oh, you can't do things like that? And I'm a, I'm I start fighting with her because because I'm I was telling her, You cannot be doing things, these are we live in these times, we're gonna be persecuted. Shame on you. And we're not fighting back and forth over it. My mom is just worried that she wow. didn't want to get yes. arrested. Then afterwards, um, I talked to a very good friend of mine about it because I was like venting on the phone and I expected that he's going to encourage me and be like, oh, good for you. You're like such a saint. <laughs> 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 I can see the icon now. <laughs> 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 so my friend goes, he's like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's so easy for you to do those frustrations, but you can go and apologize to your mom now. And I was like, why would I apologize? <laughs> and he said, yeah, that's exactly how the devil works. So yes, it's like you're fine. You can do these yeah. things very easy, but you cannot go and apologize to your mom. So you have right. to go and apologize yeah. and ask for forgiveness. That's a good friend. And that was so hard yeah. to do. Like, I feel so easy to do this with Tanya and to cross myself and blah, but to go and ask my mom for forgiveness, yeah. it was like breaking my will. Exactly. And I realized it's about that. That was it is. meant to go to God. Yeah, that's, right. Yeah, that's, right. that's yeah. right. I don't know if all of you heard her on Zoom. Uh, what she said was yeah. after she frustrations uh, in front of the icons in Agio Sophia and all, later on, she said, you know, you start to feel good. Like, I made a statement for my Christian faith. And basically, she said, you know, you start to get pride there. And her, when they went back to the hotel room with her mother, her mother and she got into an argument, basically, because she said, you shouldn't have done that, etc. And so she talked to a friend who she thought was going to give her some good feedback and encourage her and all. And he said, no, he said, you made a statement. But what's more important is your relationship with your mother. Now go make peace with her. And so what happens is, we can always turn something good into something prideful. And, you know, it, it sometimes you just have to silently or in um, a very small way make the sign of the cross or whatever, and you still get your point away. But I think what Marco said is important. You don't know what impact that may have had on that other woman who was in your face and so forth. And it probably ticked her off and realized that there are still, no matter how much we want to get rid of these people, there's too many Christians around that are still taking that. Christ. Johnny Rubin, you, you, yeah. by the way, he's doing really well over in Melbourne. Those of you who remember uh, Yanni uh, Rubin, he, he was a convert here. He's now um, in... He's our godson in Melbourne. Melbourne. And he's so happy what he's doing with the fire and rescue. Right. But he... He and I were over at Safety Harbor Pier. We're on the cast net uh, last year, and we had ourselves suddenly a whole bunch of people around us, 
watching and wanting to learn how. And a guy came up and and was showing helping me with head through nets. And Yanni was new to it. And so but he, he got it to work. But what we noticed was there was some Chinese engineers from they were staying at the big resort there. They were watching us. It was absolutely amazing to see how interested they were, and they were very shy. And then they we got to knowing them by throwing the net. Yeah. And let and let them learn how to do it. This is what's amazing. We ended up hearing them ask questions. Mm -hmm. We saw the cross. Wow. Uh -huh. This young man was asking questions in his broken English about. Tell us about. Oh, he even mentioned right Jesus' on, name. Right yeah. there on the pier. Yeah. They have been so hungry for this. Yes. In oh, yeah. China. Yeah. Yeah. And so we got their emails. Mm. I was hoping you'd get her email too. You know? <laughs> 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 yeah, you never know, you know, what you said there, too. These are two Chinese people, you know, they're talking to you, etc. You don't know what impact you may have had on well, them. I got to tell them basically what it's about. Good. And he said... Because they saw the cross. And yeah. they just figured out we were Christians. Yeah, and very good. Came, he said, we came here looking for this. Oh, wow. And up on the wow. So we're just throwing the net. And I said, we're fishers of men. Yeah. <laughs> it was so I was waiting to see how long it would take you to get those. <laughs> <laughs> call you Peter Marcos or <laughs> it was so awesome. It was it was I knew God was right there. Right. Jesus, Holy Spirit. The Trinity yeah. was with us on Yeah, you, you're right. You're right, Marcos. You're right. Okay. Thank you for sharing that too. Yeah. <laughs> 153 of no. <laughs> uh, okay, moving right along. Wherever I was. Second bullet after C. In describing Christ as a man, Greek anthropos, St. Paul focuses on the divine dispensation or plan of salvation in which the timeless word became incarnate. Incarnate, he took on human form for our sake. The eternal word became a man, and as a man gave himself as a ransom for all. For whom? Gentiles, Gentiles as well as Jews. Jews. St. Paul uses the metaphor of a ransom, Greek, antilithron, to show how we who were formerly slaves to death are now set free. The redeeming death itself forms the definitive witness of love of God. Very good. It's the definitive witness of to the love of God and his universal care for all people. This ransom proves once and for all that God desires to embrace and save the world. Very important. He came for all of us. Okay. Now, let's discuss this statement. God is willing to save all, though he does not will to save all. He desires the salvation of all, but did not decree the salvation of all. God delights in the eternal perishing of no one, though he has designed a world where some do perish eternally. Thus, we distinguish between what God would like to see happen and what he has designed will happen. There is a great tension and mystery in all of this, but there is no mystery in the revealed basic bedrock biblical truth. God desires all men, all persons to be saved. What do you think of that statement? Yes, Kevin. I think that it goes back to the beginning of man, and I think that it shows that that you know, God, we're not robots. We're not robots. You know, right. I come from a Calvinist type of doctrine. So, we what this, uh, for those who may not know John Calvin, what did you come from the Calvinist background? What did John Calvin teach? So, he taught that basically man does not have free will. Okay, man does not have free will. And what's the big word that they use? Total depravity. Total depravity. Yeah. So, basically, man is dead in his sin and he can't choose a God. God and so, therefore, what happens? 
Um, they're basically the elect, so God chooses whom he wants. And what's the word they use for that? Uh, unconditional election. Yeah, or predestination. Yeah, predestination. yeah. That's in another church. In in one of the churches he belonged to, reformed. they call it, everyone that's based on John Calvin, who was a reformer, uh, they basically said that we we are we live in a uh, simple world, we're depraved, and God chooses who will be saved. That's the bottom line, if I could yeah. sum it up. So they don't believe in like synergy. So synergy basically is like man and man and God come together, Coming together. for like salvation, but they believe like God is sovereign <laughs> over even our will. So we don't have a will. And, and that's why he said, when you think of it that way, you're almost like a robot. Yeah. You're a robot. He programs you, if I can use technology. We just got this recently in a, in a conversation. That it, to me, it also seems like that God would be cruel. Yeah. Because yeah. these uh, souls are going to be damned forever, and they had no choice. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and that's a good point. That's a good point. That, in, in other words, what um, Miguel is saying, basically, that you, when you look at a God like that, he's going to be, what's the word, partial, mm -hmm. on who will be saved and who's not, and there are going to be a lot of damned people. Yes, Jose. I was going to say, like, like the the synergistic way of looking at yeah. it, it makes more sense because if you look at the fall, yes. it's free will that separates you. So it makes sense that free will is what brings you. Very good. Well, they like to go around that. They'll say that, like, Adam and Eve had free will, but then they say, like, when the fall happened, yeah. it all came into a total depravity. Yeah. So they had their chance and they ruled it for the rest of us. <laughs> In other words, go back and play Madam and Eve. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I guess that's uh that's a thing. Is there somebody else who wants yes, Kristen? Um, I was in a, a theology class back in high school who likened it to the Calvinistic viewpoint. You're a you're a goldfish and at the at the pet store. Yes. Waiting for the magic net to come and take you. Yes. And if they don't come get you, then you're either gonna live or you're gonna be the one that goes belly up. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. But your point, Kevin, was what what you see now in the way the Orthodox reviewed and what we just talked about. There's a synergy. There's a working together, and therefore God sent His Son, died on the cross. We have the choice to believe in him or not but he'll never ever force anyone now it goes back to one thing when you think of what he did on the cross and when you think of why he created adam and eve and why he gave us a free will there's only one word that could be and what was that out of his love, love. Mm -hmm. it love. all goes back to love it, it, we we keep going back that if if you love somebody, you will give them a choice. You will give them a choice to love you back or not. Yes. Yeah, I think in, also in the councils they talk about because Jesus assumed human nature in general. Right. That means we have free will because he had free will. Yes. So. Yeah, and, and for, hey, he had the free will also. Yeah. Okay, any other comments then? All right, let's read the footnote there on the bottom of page. I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the bottom of page 1634, we're going to read, uh, I'll, I'll read 2, 3 to 5. The, the re religions of the Greek world were pluralistic and elite. In contrast, Paul teaches that there is one Savior, one God, and one mediator. And God offers salvation equally to all, for he created us to share in his goodness. And for this end, he became a man like us. So, again, there is only one mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, what does that say about when we pray with the saints? What are we asking them? Do they mediate, per se, in the same way Christ mediated? No. What's the difference, uh, um, would I, you say? I would say the saints, it pretty much help you get closer to Christ, but Christ just helps you. He can forgive you. He can okay, and that's the book. Yeah. They can intercede for us. But he's the mediator, and he died for us, and he's the one who will make the decisions for us. Uh, um, the, the word mediator in Greek is actually, if you look at the Septuagint, it's the same word used for Moses. Uh, so this would be tied to the fact that he is the mediator of the new covenant, like Moses was the mediator. Like Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, Christ is the mediator the, of the new. The saints are not the mediator of, right. the, of the covenant, so that, that would be the difference. There. And the difference there. Yes, what i Watching a video on this exact passage, I think, before coming here. Good. And he was he was saying that 
the two great commandments that Christ gives us is one, love God with, love all, your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. He said that if the saints are made perfect in heaven, it makes sense that, if, you know, obviously they're going to love God more. Yeah. If they're in heaven. It yeah. would make sense if they love everybody else more. It's intensified. It's kind of one of the forms that you can love someone is yeah. pray for them. Is pray for them. Yeah, that's the ultimate. When you think about it, the ultimate act of love, it, other than laying it down one's life for <clears throat> your friend, as it would say, you know, is to pray for them. And that's why prayer becomes very important. Father, uh, this is so interesting, and it's something that's become clearer and clearer to me is the more consistent we need more yes, to, right. that becomes yes. a, a spiritual shield around this yeah. person. Yeah. The, the prayer, it becomes a prayer uh, shield or wall yeah. to, for protection, but also there's power in that. Exactly. There's power that I think a lot of times people will say who that they have sensed other people's prayers for them. And it could be in for various reasons. Okay, moving on to, I want to read, and then we'll stop here at the footnote for 2.5. The religions of the Greek world were, no, excuse me, 2.5. Some who are opposed to the established church use this verse to claim that all you need is Jesus, not the church, her clergy and her sacraments. But the Son became the one mediator by becoming man through the Holy Spirit and a virgin. That is through God and men. He built his humanity not from himself alone, but from another, the Virgin Mary. Likewise, as the mediator, he says, I will build my church. He establishes her leaders and her worship. As Mary gives us Christ in his humanity, the church introduces us to him who alone is our mediator. Okay, let's end there with D, and then we'll be finished for the night. In using the term teacher of the Gentiles or of the nations. Paul claims a great dignity for the term teacher. Didaskalos. Didaskalos. Retain great nobility. It is like our present title doctor, which originally meant teacher, one skilled in doctrine, in that one claiming to be a doctor today receives great respect. Paul claims such respect for himself, saying to all the nations, or excuse me, saying that God has made him an instructed, instructor. Instructor He's also a model, M-O-D-E-L, and what? Benefactor. 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 Instructor, model, and benefactor to all the nation. This claim is not motivated by any egoism. Rather, Paul is simply asserting the authority that God bestowed on him so that all might recognize his authority and benefit from it. All right, we'll stop and start with 2-8. Next week, we'll meet on Tuesday at uh, 6.30. Any last-minute comments before we read the prayer? Is that right? Yeah, teacher. Yeah. Okay, let's stand and we'll finish with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord our God, that again on this occasion, you have opened our eyes to the light of your wisdom. You have gladdened our hearts with the knowledge of truth. We entreat you, Lord, help us always to do your will. Bless our souls and bodies, our words and deeds. Enable us to grow in grace, virtue, and good habits, that your name may be glorified. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.